Hey, what is going on everybody? My name is Payne and welcome back to another anime review video and before I get into this review, uh, let, let me tell you guys a story. A story about how the movie that I'm going to be reviewing got stuck in my head for all the wrong reasons, basically. So it happened back in mid-September when I was waiting to leave my house to go to the airport so I can go to Vegas for my 18th birthday. The problem was, is that the plane left at 6 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. I had to stay up on Monday night to leave at 3 in the morning. So I didn't sleep at all, I was bored, uh, I, I had to take a couple things so I had to stay up. I could not think of anything else to do and so I decided that while I was up around midnight, 1 in the morning, I decided I was going to go on my phone and uh, look at a movie that I kept hearing a lot about known as Perfect Blue and in the end it was the worst decision I ever made in my life. Coming from a guy who likes horror movies and mainly anything horror related due to the fact that, you know, those things really don't scare me. This movie was fucking terrifying. Not only was this movie both scary visually and mentally, but it also had the rare ability of being more and more relevant as time goes on. Why exactly? Well, there's only one way to find out. Here is the one, the only, one of the most terrifying things I think I've ever seen. Perfect Blue. Perfect Blue is a psychological horror film that was directed by the late Satoshi Kon in his directorial debut as this would be one of four films that he would direct before passing away in 2010 at the age of 46 due to pancreatic cancer and the movie was made by the studio Madhouse. It was released in Japan on February 28th, 1998 although some people will say it came out in 1997 and it is one hour and 21 minutes long or 81 minutes long. Based off of a light novel titled Perfect Blue Complete Metamorphosis by Yoshikazu Takaguchi, it was originally going to be made as a live action film, but the budget was reduced to animation after the production studio that was going to be used for the live action movie was damaged by the 1995 Kobe earthquake. That was when they turned to Satoshi Kon, who at the time was only known for working on the script for the JoJo's Bizarre Adventures OVAs that came out in 1993, and with the help of Akira creator Kasahiro Otomo, who was credited as a special supervisor to help sell the film to various film festivals around the world, Kone's career as a filmmaker would start with a groundbreaking bang. Both Kone and Sadayuki Murai, who wrote the screenplay for the film, later asked Takeuchi, the author, if they could change some things in the film, to which he said yes, as long as they kept a few important elements from the novel. Eventually, a live-action movie was made in 2002 titled Perfect Blue, You May Not a Semente, that would stay more true to the novel than the anime film did, although reviews of, the, of that movie came out saying that it was actually pretty boring. As for this anime movie, the film follows Mima, a pop idol singer who retires from music to pursue an acting career, much the, to the dismay of her manager Rumi due to the roles that she's been getting, and as she later discovers to be a victim of stalking by an enraged fan who doesn't improve of her career change, both in real life and online, she starts losing her sense of reality as she starts being haunted by visions of her former self and starts harboring feelings of guilt due to her career change. This movie has been referenced a few times since its release in theaters, starting when director Darren Aronofsky bought the rights for a live-action remake to Perfect Blue, and while that project never got off the ground, it influenced a scene from the 2000 film Requiem for a Dream, in which the main character was seen in a fetal position in a bathtub with her head in the water, in a scene that was influenced from a very similar bathtub scene in Perfect Blue, and Aronofsky's worth was later compared again to the anime film with 2010's Black Swan when that was released. And although he said both movies were very similar in nature, he said that Perfect Blue wasn't the inspiration for the movie. The movie also got a little bit more attention in 2001 when Madonna used clips from the movie in her Drowned World Tour as it was used as a video interlude for one of her songs titled What It Feels Like For A Girl. So after all of that, let's get into the review portion of the video. As you get more and more into Satoshi Kon's movies, you start to see a pattern with its works, and it's that he likes to blur the line between reality and fantasy. It becomes evident in the movie every time Mima sees visions of herself that this is a groundbreaking trait, but the way he does it in Perfect Blue that barely anyone else has done before, but many filmmakers have adopted uh, so many times afterwards, is that the line between reality and fantasy is blurred so much that it not only affects the main character, but it also affects the viewer as well, as there would be scenes where a scene would begin that looks like it would continue the main plot of the story, but instead would be a scene 
from a show that Mima is starring in, and that there would be certain scene transitions that would symbolize Mima's grasp between reality and fantasy. It's these aspects and the overall plot of the movie, which I thought for the first 30 minutes would be revolutionary for its time, considering that they used the internet and it was 1998, but the final hour of this movie still gets to me to this very day, as it's filled with plot twists that moves the film to a completely different direction, one that I never thought it would go to, that makes the movie's execution of its plot something unlike anything I've ever seen before. And as much as I would love to continue praising the story, I can't bring myself to do it. It's something that must be experienced and not spoiled. I, I want you guys to watch this as well if you haven't had the chance. As for the animation being released in, again, 1998, uh, the movie will of course look dated when compared to today's work, uh, but when it is compared to other works of the time, however, it stands out with great fluidity. Uh, some of the artistic choices are a bit strange, especially the character designs, which ironically enough Satoshi Kon helped on, <laughs> uh, but there is nothing that will detract from the experience. Uh, one outstanding factor of this is the cinematography. The angle of scenes being changed gives a certain amount of depth of vision that most other series can't come close to matching, even today. The soundtrack for Perfect Blue is one of the most haunting and disorienting things I have ever heard. Much like that of well-made horror movies, the feeling of suspense can be gradually built and released or suddenly come to a climax. However, there is nothing worthy in and of itself, and the songs that Mima's idol group sings are grating on the ears at best. Mima is developed very extensively throughout the movie as she is the sole protagonist. Personally, I developed a great attachment to her throughout the movie, sharing her fear, depression, and confusion throughout the whole film. She makes a fantastic protagonist and wonderfully illustrates the theme of loss of innocence. The supporting cast also does pretty well with Rumi and her stalker being the main side characters. Rumi uh, is very well developed herself, especially in the latter half of the series, as the story is tied together, and the stalker, while far less explored, still has his motivations clearly explained, and the viewer gets a fantastic look into a deranged mind. Uh, overall, it is one of the best protagonists I have ever seen, followed up by a strong supporting cast. Now it is time for me to call back to what I said at the beginning of the video, when I said that this movie had the rare ability of being better with age, and that is with the use of the internet. Uh, could you, could you stop the music, please? All right, th thank you. Uh, all right. When Satoshi Kon and Madhouse originally wrote the adaptation in 1995, they wrote it during a time where two key things were at play. One, the internet was still a thing that barely anyone, except for the people who helped create it, really delved into. And two, when it came to incidents like stalking and cyber stalking, although it could happen to anyone at any time, the incidents that we all remember would involve anyone with a persona, such as an actor or an athlete, or in this case, an idol. But as the years go by and the internet is getting used by more and more people, these incidents are not only aimed towards actors and singers. Sorry. Not only do I use this phone to read the scripts of all my videos, just like every other hardworking human being, I also use this phone for social media, whether if it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, basically anything at this point, especially in this day and age. And with that ability means that you have an online persona where you can talk with other people freely through the comfort of your phone or your laptop but that also might mean that you don't know who you're talking to or you don't know who's looking at your posts at any time. The reason why I think this movie is the most terrifying movie I have ever seen is not because of what's in the movie, but it's the internal fear that stems from the movie into the viewer psychologically. Because that we all have a persona, an audience that looks at what we post and talk about every day, in this day and age, anyone could be the next Mima. I could be the next Mima. You can be the next Mima. Not that I ever want that. Someone at school that I know very well could be the next Mima. Anyone can be the next Mima. All because after 20 years, this thing is just no longer limited to just entertainers 
but now to anyone who has, a, has an electronic device in hand. To conclude this video, if you are a fan of suspense, mystery, drama, thrillers, you will love this film. Perfect Blue appeals to so many psychological elements and has such an intricate setup that it can be watched again and again, noticing new things each time. The second watch can even be better than the first, and once you know the end, you can trace the story backwards to the origin and it could just turn into a whole nother experience. And also, just a little warning before you go watch Perfect Blue, this movie does contain fully uncensored and graphic sexual scenes, especially in one scene midway through the movie. Uh, there is a significant amount of violence as well, but it's not too gory. Uh, but regardless, I would still strongly advise against younger viewers watching this, especially anyone 17 or younger. And with that, I'm going to give this innovative masterpiece, also known as Perfect Blue, a 10 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching my Perfect Blue review video. This is something that has been stuck in my head for a while, and I'm happy that I get to uh, make it into a video. If you like this video as well, hit the like button down below. If you want to see more anime review videos in the near future, you can hit the subscribe button either on the screen or down below. Or if you want to see uh, any anime review videos that I made in the past, uh, there is going to be some videos on the screen in the description, and the rest of them will be in my channel down below. And with that, my name is Payne. I'll see you in the next video.